Hello everyone and welcome back to my KSP 1.1 tutorial series. In this episode we are going to try and make orbit and the first thing I want to do is unlock some more parts because I've got 23 science. This one costs 20 science, this costs 18. What I really want to do is get these radial decouplers which will allow us to add boosters to the side of our rocket instead of directly in line with the rocket and that will be helpful. If you recall our previous attempt to reach orbit failed Putting extra boosters on the side will probably help it succeed. So here we go, we research that, and let's go to the VAB. Here's the rocket that we used to attempt to make orbit last time. I never named it, I'll still probably not name it for now. Um, it's a dime a dozen sort of rocket, and not exactly what you want. It's really tall, it's got all these parts, so it's sort of wobbly. Uh, because each of those parts involves a joint, and so you get a lot of sway in it. And uh, it's just not the best thing that we will eventually build to get this capsule into orbit. It's just because we have limited parts right now that we have to build something like this. Now, we could help it get into orbit by adding a solid fuel booster at the bottom here. But then it'd be even taller and even more wobbly. So what I aim to do is add boosters on the side. So radial decoupler. And let's say we're going to just go all out and add four. Now, once again, the solid fuel boosters are cheaper than the liquid fuel engines. So while we could put like two uh, long stacks, in fact, identical to this center stack, we could put it on the side. Uh, we could do that, for instance, by pressing Alt and duplicating. And then we could, well, that's four of them. But we could easily put these radial decouplers. Let's just have two of them. And then putting these on those, ooh, okay, right there. And then, hmm, I don't know if they're actually attached properly. It seems like it, but not quite. I think the way I pulled uh, the duplicate off of the center stack might mess it up a little bit. Anyway, but I don't want to do that, because that's going to be more expensive. That's going to be important for career mode. You don't want expensive stuff, and this method will be cheaper. So, more boosters. And if you want to be nice about it, you'll put nose cones. Uh, how much drag you get without nose cones, it's probably substantial and might hurt your maneuverability. Yeah, it might be a little bit awkward trying to fly with it without the nose cones. In the olden days, in early versions of KSP, it was not so bad. The aerodynamics used to be much more forgiving about blunt-ended objects. Now it's a little bit more realistic. Now, you see... Even if I move the boosters down, our engine still sort of sticks out. So that's not good for the situation on the launch pad while we're standing on the launch pad, right? Well, we, we can solve that problem. Uh, we can use our little move gizmo. Click here, press C, and I'm just going to tuck the engine in. I mean, just completely just tuck that engine in so that it will balance properly on the launch pad. Now, if you do this, sometimes the rocket will explode. Uh, it completely depends on the game, but once you've figured out a safe way to tuck things in, you can just keep using that. So I believe this will be a safe way to tuck things in. in. Maybe that's changed in 1.1. We will find out. Now, we've got a lot of thrust starting out. Uh, we've got these four boosters, but these four boosters don't have gimbling, so we will want to have the main engine here also activate at the same time so we can control the rocket. Um, and just for my uh, safety sake, I'm gonna activate the reaction wheels because this could be quite quite a adventure that we're about to have. Now these have a thrust, let's say, of, let's just round and say 200 kilonewtons. And that means that's 800 there and then the center engine has, let's say, 160. So 960 altogether. That's a lot considering our mass suggests that we really only need about 300 to get off the ground. So we could tune those boosters down to about halfway. If they're halfway, their thrust at sea level will be like say 100 and that's 400 plus uh, 160, that's 560, that's still more than enough. So let's do that. Let's say 50% throttle and once you do it on one booster Symmetry will ensure that it is true for all the boosters, though you might want to double check on that, just in case. Okay, so here's a new orbital rocket. Let's take it out and see what happens. I'll keep Jeb in the pilot seat, uh, since he didn't get a chance to do 
what he was supposed to do. Here we go. Okay, here we are, standing stoutly on the launch pad. SAS is on, throttle is up. Will this work as intended? Will there be explosions? Will I ever remember to dump the monopropellant? Hmm, so many questions. All right, let's go. Well, it's going up at a nice clip. We can start turning at about 100 meters per second is a good benchmark. And actually, if you start turning like that, you can click this prograde vector. And for the most part, it's just going to follow that uh, marker where your thrust is going down. It's just going to keep going down with it. Uh, but it's not going down fast enough. I didn't put it off to the side enough. You have to give it an initial kick that's that'll work. And my initial kick was not good enough. We've got a little bit of a rotation. You need at least two gimbling engines to kill a rotation, though the reaction wheel could probably handle it. Okay, we're separating the boosters. The boosters are off, and now it's our main engine doing everything. We're, we're going pretty darn fast already, so I'm going to throttle down. How high is our apoapsis? Apoapsis, the peak of our orbit, is already very, very high. That's not very efficient. What we really wanted to do was sort of make a very smooth transition to horizontal. But because I didn't start turning quickly enough, uh, we're going up very fast, but not not using a lot of fuel to go horizontal. So that's not very good. Right now, we're through the thick part of the atmosphere. So I'm just going to go straight out here. Because deviating from the prograde vector is no longer going to flip me over. Once you pass about 30 kilometers, you no longer have to worry about flipping. So I don't have to follow the prograde vector down anymore. And I really need to build up the horizontal velocity. Our vertical component is high enough. We've already got enough height here. We just need to go faster and faster horizontally. Okay, so that's what we're doing right now. We are still on the first stage, which is good. That is a good indication that we will make orbit this time. We should. We had a lot more power. Remember, 2,300 meters per second is what we're aiming for here. But we also have to bring Jeb back down, so we can't just go into orbit and run out of fuel and then not be able to deorbit Jeb. And I'll talk about how to deorbit safely. Okay, separation. And throttle up and ignition. Now you'll note that I do separation and ignition separately, that is to avoid explosions. Uh, otherwise, the heat from this exhaust may heat up the other part and cause that part to explode. That will not cause damage to this craft, but it's just a little bit annoying. Though, if you enjoy explosions, you can do that. You can uh, uh, light the engine and separate at the same time. Certain real rockets do that. Some Certain real rockets actually ignite the engine before separating the first stage. That is called hot staging, for obvious reasons. But uh, most rockets, they separate the stage, let it get a safe distance away, then ignite this engine. Okay. So right now, our height is pretty good. And if we keep uh, our throttle up, we're just going to go higher and higher. I don't need to do that. It's probably a good idea to get closer to our apoapsis before continuing this burn so that I don't keep pushing the apoapsis up. You could also start pointing at the ground if you'd like, but that's not as efficient. Once you've got the height that you like, and 120 kilometers sounds great, you can just uh, wait until you are approaching this point, though you need to leave some time to do the burn, and then start burning. Now, if you wanted to figure out how much time it's got to take you to do the burn, uh, there are possibilities. For instance, you can use this maneuver node system. I haven't showed this before, and we'll talk more about how to use it. But now, let's say we want to get into a nice circular orbit. And 125 by 126 is pretty good. And it says, estimate burn one second. It is wrong. <laughs> so... So it would be nice if that, that worked. Uh, there is a mod to make the estimated burn time better. But uh, currently, uh, only after you start throttling up does it really read the proper number, which in this case was 25 seconds or so. And then, then you can plan it out. So you might want to give a little burst of the engine to make sure it gets the correct estimated burn time.
and then you'll be all right. It's still not quite right. It's particularly obvious that it's not right when it comes to the the longer burns. It doesn't take into account the fuel being depleted properly. It assumes that your acceleration will be constant. Okay, so that's pretty good. Now, one thing you'll want to do is when you make a maneuver like that, when you make a maneuver, you want to do half of the burn before the maneuver and then half of the burn after the maneuver. Specifically, you want to do half of the delta V before the maneuver and half of the delta V after the maneuver. So, I've mentioned delta V before, but I haven't gotten into details. Ooh, the space music is on. Let's say we wanted now to transfer to the moon here. Right? That's got to be our next target anyway. Set that as target. In career mode, you have to unlock all this stuff. You have to unlock the maneuver nodes. You have to unlock the ability to target the moon and all that. That's why it's a little bit more tedious and why we're starting in science mode. But let's say I wanted to get to the moon. And I happen to know that uh, from experience that uh, there are ways to calculate this. But some, sometimes you can just get these things from experience that about that angle will be fine for uh, starting our burn to the moon. Because the moon is going to go forward, we're going to sort of meet up with the moon over here somewhere. And so you see, there was a, there, there's a moon encounter. Okay, here it's showing me the delta V that I need to do this. Okay, like I said, every maneuver you want to do in space will have a certain delta V amount that is associated with it. And in this case, this particular maneuver uh, will take 826.1 meters per second. Obviously there is a way to calculate this beforehand and obviously the game is doing that for you. And so here is the time to this burn and if you do this burn and you do half of it before, so about 413 meters per second before the time and 413 meters per second afterwards, you are going to get this trajectory and fly by the moon. You are not going to get into orbit around the moon. What's going to happen is you'll fly by the moon, and then you'll end up in this green orbit around Kerbin again. Because you'll need to slow down at the moon and match the moon's orbit in order to actually stop there and stay around the moon. Okay, that will be called a uh, Moonar Insertion Burn. In the real life, it's a Lunar Insertion Burn because our moon is known as Luna. But if you don't do that, you end up in this high orbit here. You can get a free return trajectory, which means that if you do the burn a little bit differently, let's say I do it a little bit further on, I don't know if I can get a free return here. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, you can do a loop-the-loop -loop around the moon, and then you can get the periapsis really close to Kerbin. And if you get the periapsis really close to Kerbin, you can actually hit the atmosphere again. So here, if we do this burn, it costs a little bit different, but if we can oop that's actually hitting the planet not let's say around there there we're really in the atmosphere 19 kilometers so what will happen is we do this burn we go out to the moon we swing by it we get the moon's help to come back around actually we in this case we're not really getting the moon's help to come back around it's just that we're going so far away from the moon it doesn't influence us that much but uh, we come back around and then we hit Kerbin's atmosphere and the atmosphere will bring us down because it's got all that drag. And you can see how much it costs to do that. In general, going to the moon will take about 850 meters per second, but for now we are not going to do that. We are going to enjoy the fact that Jebediah Kerbin is in orbit. And uh, let us get to the daylight sign and see what biomes we can hit. We're at the equator, which is not the best place to hit uh, various locations around Kerbin. This might be a different biome. I can't really see. It's very dark. But I can EVA jab. I can ask him to get an EVA report. And this is above Kerbin's highlands. Okay, so that's new. 4.8 science. Let's keep that. And we can board by pressing B. We can also try a crew report, but uh, we've done in space near Kerbin. Again, that one is not biome dependent not dependent on the ground biomes around Kerbin. But let's get into daylight and see what we can see. Here we go. These look like mountains, not just highlands. Let's try that. Mountains are another biome. Oh, it's just grasslands. We've done that before. 
Um, hard to believe that these aggressive. Maybe I'm I'm over this part, and if I wait a little bit longer, can we try again? Nope. Well, and this is a thing that you will be doing. <laughs> Trying to hit new biomes. Now we obviously have plenty of fuel. It's possible that we actually have enough fuel to transfer somewhere. Well, those were definitely mountains, but I think we crossed around there. So we didn't hit them. That's a desert. Deserts. Good. Keep experiment. Board. Okay. There is the KSC. So we've completed a whole orbit now. We're passing by. Let me show you my sort of standard deorbit deorbit parameters. Uh, there is a peninsula to the east of the KSC. Okay, this peninsula over here, and opposite of that peninsula, I make my retro burn. This is just my preference. You can do it however you like, uh, as long as you get the kerbal back down. I like a fairly gentle ride, and this provides that. But it takes longer sometimes. But it doesn't take much delta V. So if you have very little delta V left, if you have very little fuel left, then this is probably the best way to do it. It doesn't take as much effort. So what you're going to do is, now that you are on the opposite side of the planet from the KSC, you will just have to hit retrograde. And that will point to the opposite of the direction that you're headed in, right? Uh, if you want to speed up, you point prograde, which is in the direction that you're currently headed in. That's aligned with your velocity vector, if you will. So you're currently actually going that away, straight that away. And then Kerbin is actually pulling you to the side here with its gravity, and that's why you go around the planet. That's why it takes this particular velocity because this is the speed that you're going straight out like that, where Kerbin's pull in this direction is not enough to pull you down to the planet again. So that is the direction we're going in, and if we point our rocket opposite that, then we will slow down. So right now you see we are going 2,200 meters per second, and that's not 2,300 because we're higher. The higher your orbit, the slower your orbit. The closer to the planet you are, like let's say 80 kilometers, the more like 2,300 meters per second you are. And if we take a look at the moon's orbit, the moon is orbiting Kerbin at only 542.5 meters per second. And so if we want to match the moon's orbit or just go right above the moon's orbit or something like that, uh, we would also be going at that speed. And then... Minmus over here, Kerbin's other moon, is only going at 274 meters per second. Okay, and so you can figure out how that works. So, and as you get further out, you get closer to escape, but we'll get to that when we actually have craft escaping. Those are nice circular orbits, by the way. You can get into an elliptical orbit. You can get into an elongated orbit, like the one that we were transferring to the moon with. That was an elongated orbit, right? It wasn't circular. And that one, when you're close to Kerbin, it's going really, really fast. When you're out at the moon, it's going really, really slowly. Which is helpful, because when we get to the moon, we don't want to be going very fast. When we get to the moon, we want to be going very slowly, because that'll make it easier to slow down to get captured by the moon. If we're going very fast when we get out to the moon, we won't get captured. Okay, but we'll see all that in action some other time. Let us retro burn. So this is bringing our orbit down, and you can see the periapsis dropping here. I might have done it late because I was talking so much. Yes, indeed. Uh, ideally, I'd want my periapsis over this peninsula. It's out over here somewhere. And getting it down to 25 kilometers will probably do the trick. 24.4 is fine too, at least by prior experience. It's got to be nighttime over there. So that's a little bit sad. We'll see how close to the KSC we get. Now, we've deorbited. It didn't take too much fuel, but again, I was doing it in a location where the fuel use is minimal for that. Now we can get rid of the rest of this rocket and uh, use the heat shield to keep us safe. 
And there's no particular reason why we can't do that now. So let's do that now. Okay. Separate. And now it's just a cap seal. That will re-enter and burn up. And this will re-enter and hopefully be safe. Ooh, it's jittering quite a lot. Why is it doing that? Hold on. Let's turn SAS off and SAS back on again. Tell it to go retrograde. It's it's really jittery. Hmm. That's funny. Okay. Um Yeah, you don't need SAS on, but what happens is it's get it gets really hard to stabilize your rocket without it. But let's activate that. Okay. I'll just stick to stability assist. And I'll just manually turn myself to the retrograde vector. There are no jitters now. For some reason, holding it to the retrograde marker was causing it to jitter around a bit. I don't know why. Uh, there are feedback loops and stuff like that where um, the way it's controlling it might uh, cause it to jitter like that. And so sometimes you'll want to turn off SAS. If you see your craft uh, doing anything weird, one thing you can do is just turn off SAS to see if it... Uh, it is causing the problem by the way it's trying to stabilize your craft so we're gonna hit the atmosphere and right now I'm time warping very nicely but then once we hit the atmosphere we are now limited to physical time warp again going to turn it using the all-powerful reaction wheels you can see we are going faster as we get closer to Kerbin and it's because we are now in a, a slightly elliptical orbit. We'll be slowest up here and fastest down here. We have lost some of our height on the periapsis. That's because the atmosphere has been causing us drag. Also because of the separation of the, of the previous stage, the second stage. So that gave us a little bit of a kick too. Now SAS is using some power. Uh, the reaction wheels use the power. So if you tilt a little bit, you'll see we are losing a little bit of power. If I tilt really far, you can see electric charge depletion. So keep that in mind. We have not unlocked batteries yet. We will. But right now we don't have solar panels, we don't have batteries, so we don't have any way to replenish our electric charge. Okay, we can proceed using physical time warp. We will probably land very far east of the KSC, especially since I can see the KSC right there. Uh, try and keep it to retrograde. I don't know why we have that problem where it's jittery, but I'm not willing to trust SAS so much. Okay, now I'm gonna actually take SAS off. Remember the capsule can orient properly itself. So we really don't need SAS doing anything. Remember I told you that uh, it was much more serious coming back down from orbit? Well, here we go. And coming back from another planet's even worse. Coming back from another planet, you're going to be going 3,000, 4,000 meters per second. So you'll have to keep that in mind. That's really why we have so much ablator. Right now we have uh, way more ablator than we need to come back down from orbit, but if we were coming back from some, one of the other planets like Duna or Jewel, this might be just enough. We'll see. So the KSC is there. That's our flag that we planted. Remember landing beacon alpha. But you can only see it within a 100 kilometer radius. So once we got out of the 100 kilometer radius, it disappeared. So if you don't see the flag you planted at the KSC, that's because you're more than 100 kilometers out. Now the good thing about the trajectory that I picked is that we spend a long time in the atmosphere, so it gives us a chance to do a lot of slowing down. If you come down steeply, the g-forces will be higher, and obviously you'll slow down quicker, but that's what the g-forces are all about. G-forces are the amount of acceleration the Kerbal is facing, and if you come down steeper, the Kerbal will face much more G-force. Now, if it turns out that Jebediah is safe, the next thing we can do is get into a polar orbit and try and get readings above uh, Kerbin's poles at the Tundra, in particular. And that'll be interesting for a variety of reasons. 
a very different trajectory and different requirements to get to orbit. You'll see the little pink marker there, that's actually the moon. So uh, it so happens we're pointing directly at the moon, that's why the pink marker is there. So the pink marker is our target marker. Alright, full parachute deployment. And so after we get Jeb back, we can talk about getting into different kinds of orbits and some of the other things that you get when you bring up the SAS mark. What does normal, anti-normal, radial, radial, radial in, radial out, and the other stuff mean? That's target, so if you want it to point at the target or point away from the target, that's those two. So this is basically speed up in the same direction and slow down in the in the direction that you're currently going in. These are obviously used to change the direction that you're going in. So we were going in a very nice flat trajectory right at the equator of Kerbin. Well what if we don't want to go, go right at the equator of Kerbin? Let's say we wanted to change that and tilt up a little bit. Get what's called an inclination. Well that'll be different. What if instead of uh, going straight, we wanted to uh, have a little bit of a bulge out here, make an ellipse? Well, there are a number of ways we could do that. There's, using the radial burn would be a very inefficient way of doing that, unfortunately. Anyway, we'll get to that. Here, Jebediah seems safe. We can recover. And there we go. 15.6 science, the two AV reports, and also the recovery of the vessel. And Jeb is ready to go again. Okay, so with orbit successful, now we will try to get into a polar orbit with Valentina. A polar orbit means instead of going east to west, as we did last time, we are going to go north to south and try and go over the North Pole here and get an EVA report from that. That will get us some extra science. So that is the plan. But because we can't take advantage of Kerbin's rotation, we can only do that with an east-west orbit. We can't do that with a north-south orbit. We don't get the advantage of this 175 meters per second. We were always getting that. So we'll have to burn extra in order to get into a north-south orbit. Uh, we'll, we're going to have to use 175 meters per second more delta V, basically. Okay, so, but we did have extra buffer in the previous mission, so I expect that it will work with this rocket. Let's find out. So instead of tilting as I did to the 90 degree marker here, I am going to tilt to, well we could go either uh, north or we can go south. I'm just going to go ahead and go north. And so that will give us the inclination that we want. Inclination is basically, basically the tilt of the orbit uh, from north to south. If you've got zero inclination, you're going flat east to west. The more you go north, the more inclination you have until you have a 90 degree inclination. And then if you're going backwards, which means that you're actually fighting against the rotation of the planet, which will cost you even more delta V, then you go from 90 to 180. But straight up and down, straight north to south is 90 degrees. Now, that's important. And the reason you want a polar orbit sometimes is because Eventually, as Kerbin rotates, you will cover all of the planet. If you go in a flat east to west orbit, yes, that's more efficient because you're getting the full advantage of the rotation of Kerbin, but you are not going to be able to look at many biomes, right? You're not going to cover much ground. You're only going to cover a belt right above the equator. If you tilt a little bit, then you're going to be able to cover all of this ground. So if you're going like in orbit tilted about there, like 30 degrees. Well, then you can cover the latitudes between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. If you tilt 45 degrees, you can cover everything between the latitudes of 45 degrees north and 45 degrees south. So that's basically the idea of latitude. I mean, uh, the idea of inclination. The inclination is what latitudes you can cover. So 45 degree inclination, you can cover all the latitudes up to 45 degrees. Okay, so Throttle up, SAS is on. There are many more complicated ways of explaining this, but I don't need to do those complicated ways. Let's go. Okay, I don't want orbit. I want surface again. Orbit was giving us weird markers that we don't need right now. Let us tilt north. 
Okay. I'm gonna try and force it to go uh, a little bit flatter this time, but we've got a lot of power. So, and I don't want to go away from that prograde vector because otherwise we'll flip out. So I want to keep her steady. Make sure. Uh, so already we're not as flat as I would like, but I guess it's the best we can do with with all the the mock effects going on here. Very intense pressure on the vehicle. Okay, separating the boosters. Boosters exploded behind us. That that will happen. Okay, still trying to flatten out a little bit quicker. But I'll throttle down. Throttling down uh, helps in that we don't have to... I mean, we're not expending all of our fuel pointed in this direction. Eventually, gravity will pull that vector down. So we'll just follow it down and then we can expend more of our fuel going flat. So that's why I do that. That's why I throttle down. So you'll note that we still have sort of a tilt to this. We're not going straight north to south and that's because we still had some of the residual rotation of the planet. So instead of going just flat north, I'm going to go a little bit west to correct that. And as I tilt a little bit west, you'll note that my orbit is going a little bit west. If I went even further west, it would do that even more. Okay, now we've got that 125 kilometer peak, but it's not as wide as it used to be, so we'll need a little bit more time to really make orbit. Let's see how much delta V it'll take to make orbit here. Okay, so that's a nice orbit. Right there, it's sort of circular-ish. Well, that's not quite nice. Um, so here we want to place it you can take take a hold of the maneuver node and move it and that'll do different things you can see we need to burn a thousand six hundred eighty still uh, 40 still 48 and because we're still moving the situation changes pretty drastic that that's pretty good now I can have the craft turn to the maneuver node by pressing that button that maneuver node button. And if we do a quick test burn, mm, well, it wasn't very good. Yeah, about a minute and six seconds, it looks like. But that's with this one. The next one is at one third power. Sorry, it's in the dark. Uh, it's at one third power. So we're going to need a lot more time. Let's start out now. Okay, we're getting rid of the stage and igniting the second stage and here we see a minute and 35 seconds so we'll, we'll do about half before and half after so that'll be fine hopefully we have enough fuel to make up this 1100 meters per second delta V we are pushing our apoapsis a little bit higher that's not the greatest thing and again, if I wanted to, we can go back to stability assist and I can correct a little bit to the west here so that we can tilt our orbit a little bit more. You can also adjust the maneuver node, by the way. Let's say you wanted to uh, tilt it this way. Well, you'll take this handle here and pull it like that. And then you can see that tilts the orbit, though uh, it also did other bad things. There we go. And that's, that's the normal vector. The pink ones are the normal, uh, well, we'll call it purple because the pink ones are really the target ve vector. They look, their colors are a little bit similar, so that's not great. But anyway, here it looks like we're going north-south. I'll talk more about the normal vector in a bit. Now, you would not want to launch into an equatorial orbit and then have to change your orbit to this one. That would not be very efficient. Uh, we will see exactly how much that would cost in a sec. I'm going to add another maneuver to our peak there because it's getting really high. And I'll, I'll circularize up there. Okay. Now there are mods to help you timing the burns. So, And I'll introduce one Kerbal Engineer fairly early on because it's a very helpful mod for people, for everybody in Kerbal Space Program. The only reason you wouldn't use Kerbal Engineer is if you were absolutely dead set on not using any mods. 
That's the only reason. Okay, so we're gonna go over the North Pole here and try and get some readings. Let's see if there... I think there is a taiga or something... Uh, I forget. Uh, maybe it is tundra and then the poles. I think there's another biome close by here. Let's see. So... Valentina, EVA for me, please. EVA report. Nope, still grasslands. We've got a lot of grasslands. We could just leave Valentina outside. But... Let me have her go in while I'm time warping. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, ice caps. Alright, keep experiment. I guess ice caps will cover everything around here. Maybe there's not a separate tundra one. Maybe this bumpy area is the tundra? Maybe like right now? Nope, still ice caps. Maybe wait a little while longer. Tundra, there we go. Keep experiment. So there's still a tundra. I remember there used to be a tundra, but I wasn't sure whether they kept the tundra. Nice to know they kept the tundra. Okay, so let's talk about all the little vectors and all that that come with the maneuver node system. So I make a little maneuver node. And let me focus on Kerbin. So you can double click on Kerbin to focus on. You can double click on them. Well, you can say... Uh, focus view and then you can focus view on the moon as well but you can double click on uh, oop, sometimes double clicking isn't very helpful you can use different there's another key to switch between them I think backspace yes backspace will make you jump back to your vessel and then I can double click on Kerbin to focus on Kerbin okay so here is a maneuver and you can drag it to set when it is you just uh, click on this circle here, okay, and that will be very important to get the timing right. You can play, move or, move it around to play around with uh, when exactly you hit the moon, for instance. But here is the normal vector, an anti-normal vector. I think that's the normal one. Yep, it'll match up with the icon here, so that's normal, and that's anti-normal. Because we're going north-south right now, this is west and this is east. So if we pull it, let's see what happens if we try to flatten our orbit. Oh wait, we've just made escape. We put so much energy into our orbit that we are now escaping Kerbin. Let's say we tried to flatten our orbit, we would actually need to retro burn a little bit. Let's see exactly how much uh, delta V it would take to flatten our orbit once we're in orbit. It's a little bit suborbital on that side, but 3,000 meters per second. It takes 3,000... Well, it's not really flat. Anyway, uh, 3,000 is about what it would take. And you can calculate it out to figure it out, but the point is that it takes 3,000 meters per second to flatten your orbit when it takes only 850 tops to go to the moon. So that gives you an idea. Uh, you do not want to have to make this kind of correction in orbit. You want to go into the right inclination from the start. So this is these uh, purple handles are used to correct the inclination and you don't want to do that. The most you want to do that is maybe one degree or two degree to meet up with a space station or something like that. That's manageable. You see uh, 73 meters per second, maybe that much, 220, okay? So that's about the range that you want to stay in. You don't want to have to correct it more than that. Now, what about the radio one? Well, the radio one will shift your orbit from side to side. So here you see that we have a fairly circular orbit like this. Well, if we can shift it to one side, make it bulge out this side and actually crash into the planet probably on that side. And again, that's really only to fine tune rendezvous. Where that will become very necessary is actually when you're entering the sphere of influence of another planet. When you do that, you might want to use those handles, the radial handles. So this is the positive, uh, the, well, I guess it's radial and anti-radial, or radial in and radial out. So you'll want to use the radial in handle to nudge your orbit closer to the planet that you are currently approaching, or you will use the radial out to pull it away from 
the planet that you're currently approaching. We don't need any of this right now. Basically, if you're already in the right inclination, and you're already around the planet, all you really need to do is prograde retrograde. Okay, so we'll see more of this in action later on, but for now this is sufficient. We've done what we came here to do. Let us bring, let us bring Valentina back. Now, if we really want to get close to the KSC, we have to wait until the KSC is actually under our orbit. That's not a problem with the equatorial orbits because they're in the at the equator, and so somewhere along the orbit it'll always hit the KSC. But right now, the KSC is over here. So if we deorbited Valentina right now, there's no way she'll hit the KSC. So let's have the KSC on the daytime side and right under our orbit so that we can bring her down, or attempt to bring her down closer to the KSC. That'd be nice. You can see as Kerbin is rotating as we're going around in our orbit that we can hit any part of Kerbin. If we want to land over here, we can do that. That's the benefit of, of a polar orb orbit. Uh, if we want to land over here, we can do that. If we were in an equatorial orbit, there's no way we could land here. Now, if it is taking too long for you to time warp here because of the time warp limits, you may consider hopping back to the tracking station to time warp. See, it says cannot time warp faster than a hundred times. Well, let's get around that by going to the Space Center, clicking on the tracking station, and here we see our untitled spacecraft, and now we can time warp as quickly as we'd like. Now, the reason you have the tracking center is because you can have dozens, even hundreds of craft, and you can have debris, which is spent stages. So far, we haven't left any spent stages in orbit or anything like that. We always had those deorbit. But you might, uh, when you're going out to other planets, you might end up having a stage that is just hanging around in orbit. Um, you can have probes, rovers, landers, ships, stations, bases, kerbals that are just hanging around in EVA. Their flags, we have one flag at the KSC, but we just have that off. Other space objects, like asteroids, and unknown things that may be asteroids. Usually they're asteroids. But here you can time up as quickly as you like. No restriction. Oop, uh, now here, the KSC is over here. So if we deorbit her like now, we might stand a chance of actually hitting it. So let's jump back to the vessel and then we'll try and do that. Now I'm gonna allow some buffer here because I'd rather land in the ocean here than accidentally hit a mountain. The one thing that the capsules do not survive very well is hitting a mountain. So there, uh, if I deorbit now, the periapsis should go into the ocean, and so that would be best. So once again, retrograde. And if uh, SAS is taking too circuitous a route for you, you can always take it to retrograde on your own. Uh, light the engines a bit to bring the periapsis down. Here I'll just do 24.7, sounds fine to me. And then we will proceed down to hopefully a safe splashdown for Valentina. Now we're starting off in a higher orbit than Jeb uh, was at, so we are going to be going faster when we finally hit the atmosphere. There's the ice cap. I don't think there's any special biome on the south pole, by the way. There are some mountains. But here comes the atmosphere, so I'm not going to EVA Valentina yet. Remember, in the atmosphere, you're basically under constant acceleration. So Valentina might float off if we tried to EVA her. Oh, we need to separate out the second stage. We don't need that anymore. In theory, it might help us. It might shield us a little bit, but we don't need that. It'll be fine to just use the ablator. Okay, it's, it's jittery, so I'll just do it on my own. Okay, here we go. What's our trajectory like? So we're going, well, we're actually a little bit west of the KSC. 
we'll talk more about uh, meeting up with stuff in orbit. I'll I'll do a special rendezvous lecture and docking docking episode. But we need uh, the docking ports first. Right now we don't have any docking ports, so rendezvousing uh, isn't quite so much fun at the moment. So far we haven't deployed any goo or the science junior, which is another science experiment we can use. It's tending towards... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hmm. A bit fidgety. Let's not risk the possibility that our parachute overheats. I'll, I'll leave SAS on then. Hmm. The atmosphere wasn't really holding us to retrograde very well. I think we'll be in the water, looking at it. There's a mod that I think puts a city around here. Now, if you really want to hit the KSC directly after being in a polar orbit, my suggestion is trying to get into an orbit that has an orbital period that is evenly divisible into six hours. So a half hour orbit, 45 minute orbit, something like that. 40 minute orbit. Then you could hit the KSC. We were probably a little bit off from that and that's why we were a little bit west. Reason being that uh, you will want to hit the same location eventually after a few, uh, after a whole number of revolutions around the planet. We'll talk more about orbital period later. The main time that that comes up, orbital period, is if you want to place a Keo stationary satellite. That is a satellite that stays directly above the same location around Kerbin. And there are of course around Earth geostationary satellites which maintain the same location above the Earth. And in order to do that, you have to be at a specific altitude that happens to have a six-hour orbit, right? An orbit that matches the rotation of the planet, though you have to adjust it a little bit for the movement of the planet around the sun. We'll talk more about that when we get to those kinds of orbits. There's no need in stock KSP to place a satellite in that kind of orbit, not at the moment, but in version 1.2 the plan is to make uh, communication a little bit more complicated and with the more complicated communication then you may want to place a geostationary satellite. So best to know how to do it now. And of course there are mods that uh, require you to place communication satellites to communicate with your probes and your other missions and in that case you will want those kinds of satellites up as well okay let us recover vessel and we get 10.6 signs for that now again I'm not going through this as quickly as I could because there's a lot to explain and I think that will do it for the explanation of getting into orbit and basic orbital dynamics. There will be a lot more about that later on, but this covers the basic ideas. Alright, so if you have any questions though, please do ask them in the comments. I will attempt to answer them or cover them in a future episode. But for now, I'll say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please do press like, and I'll see you next time.